Welcome to 5 Minute School and in today's video we're going to be discussing the structure and function of skin. So the definition of skin is that it's a soft outer covering of the human body and it's the largest organ of the body. The function of skin is to provide sensation so it has a variety of nerve endings which respond to temperature, pressure and pain. Another function is protection so it has a layer which protects the body from external pathogens and another function is storage so water and lipids are stored in the skin and another function is thermoregulation so heat can be lost through the dilation of blood vessels to the skin and secretion of sweat from sweat glands and heat can be preserved by the constriction of blood vessels to keep the warm blood away from the skin so the structure of skin there are several layers the outermost layer is called the epidermis and this is the protective barrier because it's the one that's in contact with the outside environment and it consists of stratified squamous epithelium and inside that is basal and suprabasal keratinocytes and there are no blood vessels in the epidermis so the cells of the epidermis receive the nutrients from uh, via diffusion from the capillaries in the dermis which is the next layer so there's no blood vessels going to the epidermis so the nutrients it, it gets the nutrients from the capillaries in the dermis now what's in between the epidermis and the dermis is the basement membrane and this is a layer as I said between the epidermis and the dermis and the basement membrane allows for transport of cells and molecules between the two layers the layer following is known as the dermis this is a layer which consists of connective tissue and it's elastic so this is what cushions the body from stress and there's quite a lot of nerve endings in this layer responsible for providing the sense of touch and heat and this layer also contains hair follicles sweat glands sebaceous glands apocrine glands and lymph and blood vessels the layer following on from the dermis isn't technically part of the skin but it is below the dermis and it attaches the skin to the underlying bone and muscle it consists of elastin and loose connective tissue and in this layer the cells which you can see are fibrocytes macrophages and adipocytes and now a fact is that 50 percent of the body fat is stored in this subcutaneous layer so that's just a brief introduction to the topic of the skin um, I hope you found this video useful and the, the videos following on from this will look at various aspects of the skin in a bit more detail. So thank you very much for watching.
An amputation is an injury in which part of the body is completely severed. Most commonly, we would see amputations of fingers, but we also see amputations of limbs to varying degrees. Keep in mind that when the amputated part is severed away, the distal blood vessels on the still connected part will constrict clotting, will begin, and you'd be surprised at the little amount of bleeding that we see in these. Again, they respond very good to uh, direct pressure and elevation, and in the extreme cases, uh, using a tourniquet, making sure the tourniquet is tight. Now, penetrating uh, wounds, you have to be uh, considered um, that these can pierce the body, causing damage to the structures within the body. And keep in mind the direction or the angle of the penetration. So, you know, you have to think outside of just bullets and knives. People are penetrated, uh, have penetrating wounds from all types of things, uh, uh, tree limbs, uh, nail guns. So you have to consider the angle. And keep in mind that rarely is any of this stuff clean that they're being uh, stabbed or, or they have a puncture wound from and can lead to infection. That's something that you want to keep in mind. Stabbings and shootings can often result in multiple penetrating injuries. We want to assess the patient carefully and identify all the wounds. Keep in mind, multiple stab wounds, multiple areas, you have to undress the patient and look for them. Also, with um, bullet wounds, just don't look for an entrance wound, look for that exit wound if there is one. Determine the type of gun when possible but do not delay transport. Keep in mind, lower velocity handguns like 22s, the bullet can actually go inside and bounce around, causing a lot of damage. 32s, though we don't see those men very much anymore. Uh, in the past, when we did see them, the bullet would actually go in and break up, causing a lot of damage. Keep in mind with high velocity rifles, Salt rifles in particular, you have cavitation, but the cavitation just isn't caused by bullet spiraling, but from also the bullet tumbling. Something to keep in mind. Blast injuries may result in multiple penetrating injuries. The mechanism of injury from a blast injury is generally due to three factors. First off is the primary blast injury. That's the damage that's caused by the blast wave itself and the sudden pressure changes of the explosion. This can especially affect hollow organs or the eardrums. Second is blast, secondary blast injuries, which result from flying debris that cause multiple penetrating wounds. And then finally is the tertiary blast injuries. And that's where the victim is thrown by the explosion, perhaps onto a object that can cause penetrating injury. There is no specific care for small contusions, but extensive injuries can lead to hypovolemic shock. We want to watch areas closely, especially large areas like the femurs, uh, the thigh areas, or the forearms, or the humeral areas, uh, where you can have a big increase not to mention the internal injuries too. Don't forget those. Now, when we talk about the treatment of soft tissue injuries, some of you who have been athletes or have participated in a sports medicine program in high school may be familiar with the rice mnemonic. Um, rest, resting the injured area, applying ice to constrict the vessels, reducing swelling, compression, normally using a ACE wrap to also uh, reduce swelling and bleeding below the surface, elevation, and then splinting, splinting to reduce movement of the uh, 
the injured ends of the vessels that can increase bleeding. We also want to watch for signs of developing shock, anxiety or agitation, changes in mental status, increased heart rate and increased respiratory rate, diaphoresis, sweating, cool or clammy skin. Keep in mind the cool and clammy skin is the constriction of surface blood vessels of the skin, moving blood to vital organs. And finally, decreased blood pressure. Remember, decreased blood pressure is a late sign. We want to treat for shock early to make sure that we don't get them to that end stage of shock. Before caring for the patient, follow your standard precautions. Gloves and goggles as a minimum PPE. If the patient is bleeding profusely or copiously, you might want to use a gown and perhaps put on a mask. If life-threatening bleeding is observed, assign a team member to apply direct pressure, initially with the gloved hand, then using gauze pad. Cover wounds of the upper of the chest, the upper abdomen, and the upper back with occlusive dressings. These are dressings that don't let any air in, normally like Vaseline gauze, or perhaps, even though we don't carry these on the ambulance, uh, foil or a saran wrap. Control bleeding using first direct, even pressure and elevation. Normally starting with your gloved hand, then using a gauze sponge. Pressure dressings and splints to reduce bleeding or immobilize the area. Tourniquets, make sure your tourniquets are on tight. Apply appropriately and make sure you keep track of the time that you put them on. All open wounds should be assumed to be contaminated and to present a risk of infection. Apply a sterile dressing to reduce the risk of further contamination. Do not remove material from an open wound, no matter how dirty the wound is. Small wound surfaces without significant bleeding can be flushed with sterile saline uh, prior to applying a dressing. In most cases, hospital personnel rather than EMTs will clean the open wounds. And they really do get in there and scrub them. In some cases, you can better control bleeding from open soft tissue wounds by splitting the extremity, even if there is no fracture. Again, the movement will encourage bleeding. When dealing with open abdominal wounds, an open wound in the abdominal cavity may expose internal organs. An evisceration the organs protrude through the wound. Cover the wound with sterile gauze moistened with sterile saline solution. Secure the gauze with an occlusive dressing and then keep the organs moist and warm. Most patients with abdominal wounds require immediate transport to a trauma center. Now what we're seeing here in this particular slide is we're seeing parts of the intestines that are actually protruding out of these open abdominal wounds. So that's normally what you'd see is, is uh, intestines as opposed to say the liver or the spleen, something else. Now in the past, even though we don't see it much anymore, we don't see a whole lot of big open uh, abdominal surgeries. A lot of the surgeries done abdominally are done through arthroscopy, endoscopy, and so we don't see any big uh, surgical wounds. In the past, what would happen is somebody would have a surgical uh, wound and they'd either pick up something heavy or cough and these, would, these stitches would become undone and you'd get this organ protrusion, normally just a little bit of intestine uh, sticking out there, almost like a uh, open hernia. And they were just treated the same way. Uh, moist, sterile gauze with an occlusive dressing and kept moist uh, for the transport. So um, that's referred to as a dehiscence. With impaled objects, we normally just want to 
make sure that they're stabilized in place with bulky dressing. Only remove an impale object when it's through the cheek or mouth and obstructs the airway, or if the object is in the chest and interferes with Open neck injuries can be life-threatening. If the veins of the neck are open to the environment, they may suck in air. If enough air is sucked into a blood vessel, it can block the flow of blood into the lungs and cause cardiac arrest. It's a condition referred to as air embolism. We want to cover the wound with an occlusive dressing. Now, normally with these neck wounds, the first occlusive dressing you have on hand is your gloved hand. Get that over there so you reduce the uh, possibility of air being sucked into the blood flow. Apply manual pressure, but do not compress on the carotid arteries at the same time. We want to be careful of that. That would impair circulation of the brain and cause a stroke. Use caution with patients suffering from neck injury depending on the mechanism of injury. So you may want to immobilize the spine. If you can't get a cervical collar on because you're controlling bleeding, you may have to have a second person doing manual stabilization of the spine while you're taking care of the open neck wound. Small animal bites can be especially concerning. A small animal's mouth is heavily contaminated with virulent bacteria. We want to consider the safety of our crew and the patient before entering the environment. Keep in mind, the animals that we are most concerned about, especially in the Pacific Northwest, are bats and raccoons. Consider all small animal bites be contaminated and potentially infected. And all of these should be evaluated by a physician, preferably the emergency department physician. A major concern is the spread of rabies, that acute, potentially fatal viral infection. It affects the central nervous system and of any warm-blooded animal. Um, also, another thing that we want to be uh, concerned about is children, especially younger children who may be seriously injured and in some cases, as you've probably read in uh, the news, uh, killed by dogs. Be careful for the fact that the animal can also attack us. So don't enter an ASEO until the animal has been secured by the police or an animal control officer. Now, again, this is where you kind of have to use your common sense. If you have the tools and everything necessary, it's better that you get in there and, and try to uh, move the animal. Uh, we've done it before with uh, backboards or even the stretcher. Um, move them back uh, to get to a patient. So keep that in mind. Again, you want to be very concerned with your own safety. Human bites contain an exceptionally wide variety of bacteria and viruses. In fact, in some cases, they can be considered um, even worse than animal bites. Consider any penetrating uh, human bite as a serious injury, and any laceration caused by a human tooth can result in uh, spreading any infection. And of course, these days we're all very concerned with that. So once we have bleeding controlled uh, in an open injury, we want to apply a dry sterile dressing, promptly immobilize the area with a splint or bandage, and provide transport to the emergency department. Again, constantly checking for shock, appropriately checking our vitals during the transport. Burns account for approximately 3,400 deaths per year. Burns are among the most serious and painful of all the injuries we're gonna see in the field. A burn can occur when the body or body part receives more radiant energy than it can absorb, resulting in the injury. So some of the potential core, uh, causes of these would be heat, obviously, toxic chemicals, and electricity. Although a burn may be the patient's most obvious injury, perform a complete assessment to determine whether the patient has other serious injuries. This is particularly important if the burn is sustained in say like an automobile accident or an explosion. Burns can be very distracting look for other injuries. And again, be very careful 
of the patient's airway and breathing. Children, older patients, and patients with chronic illnesses are more likely to experience shock from burn injuries. Learning medicine is hard work. Osmosis makes it easy. It takes your lectures and notes to create a personalized study plan with exclusive videos, practice questions, and flashcards, and so much more. Try it free today. A burn is the damage that happens after something really hot, like a fire, hot water, or steam, or, or even, even a hot, hot object, object comes, comes into contact, contact with skin. But burn injuries can also be caused by extreme cold, electricity, some chemicals like strong acids, or radiation, like from the sun or medical treatments. Ultimately, burns cause damage and inflammation of the skin. The skin plays an important role in protecting underlying muscles, bones, ligaments, and internal organs, forming a barrier to infectious pathogens and preventing water loss from the body. Now, the skin is divided into three layers, the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. The epidermis forms the thin outermost layer of skin, and it's made up of several layers of keratinocytes, which make and secrete glycolipids, which help to prevent water from easily seeping into and out of the body. Underneath the epidermis is the thicker dermis layer that contains the nerves and blood vessels. But the dermis is divided into two layers, a thin papillary layer just below the epidermis and a deeper reticular layer. The papillary layer contains fibroblasts which produce a connective tissue protein called collagen. The fibroblasts are arranged in finger-like projections called papillae, each of which contains blood vessels and nerve endings. Nerve endings found in this layer sense pain and fine touch, which allows you to feel something like a feather touching your arm. The reticular layer of the dermis is even thicker than the papillary layer. The collagen in the reticular layer is packed very tightly together, making it excellent tissue support. In addition, fibroblasts in the reticular layer secrete elastin, which is a stretchy protein that gives skin its flexibility. The reticular layer also contains the skin's accessory structures like oil and sweat glands, hair follicles, lymphatic vessels, and nerves, and all of the blood vessels that serve these tissues. A type of nerve ending found here detects pressure or vibration, which allows you to feel someone grabbing your arm. Finally, just below the reticular layer is the hypodermis. It's made of fat and connective tissue that insulates and pads the deeper tissue and anchors the skin to the underlying muscle. When the skin is burned, it damages cells and the proteins within them. And the number of skin layers affected determines the burn degree. So in first degree burns, also called superficial burns, the burn only affects the epidermis. In second degree burns, the burn affects the epidermis and the dermis. If only the papillary layer is burned, it's considered a second-degree, superficial, partial thickness burn. But if the burn reaches the deeper reticular layer, but doesn't extend through the entire layer, then it's considered a second-degree, deep partial thickness burn. In third-degree burns, also called full thickness burns, the entire epidermis and dermis are affected. And finally, fourth-degree burns extend into the hypodermis. When a skin layer is affected, it means that the skin can't function effectively, and common complications are infections, especially from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and water loss through the damaged skin. As burns heal, macrophages move into the tissue to remove dead cells, and fibroblasts create new collagen to heal the damaged skin. The more extensive the area with new collagen, the more extensive the scar. So, scars are common in second-degree deep partial thickness burns and third- and fourth-degree burns. Symptoms of a burn depend on the degree of the burn. In first-degree, the affected area becomes red, dry, and painful. These areas also tend to blanch, turning white as blood flow is restricted with compression. 
Second-degree superficial partial thickness burns can be red with clear blisters, wet as if they're weeping, and are even more painful hey guys, than first-degree burns, but still blanch. A second-degree deep partial thickness burn may vary in color from yellow or white to red, have blisters, and can be wet or dry. Because of damage to blood vessels and nerve endings, burns of this degree may not blanch, and there may only be pain due to pressure because of nerve damage. A third degree burn can appear waxy white to leathery gray or black, and dry. Again, blanching doesn't occur and the pain may only feel like deep pressure. In other words, they can be relatively painless. Additionally, the elastin damage causes the burn to be stiff or inelastic. Finally, fourth degree burns are charred black, dry, have pain only from deep pressure, but can be painless from complete destruction of nerve endings, and have patches of dead skin. Having said that, the margins of all burns often have lots of damaged nerve endings, and that can be painful. The diagnosis of a burn is often based on the burn's appearance and the amount or type of pain, but sometimes tissue biopsies are obtained to accurately determine which layers are affected. In adults, the severity of burns is calculated using the rule of nines. The rule of nines evaluates several distinct sections of the body's total surface area for the presence and degree of burns. Eleven of the sections each make up 9% of the body's surface area and are the head, right arm, left arm, chest, abdomen, upper back, lower back, the front of the left leg, and the back of the left leg, and the same for the right leg. A final section, the groin, accounts for the missing 1% of the body's surface area. The treatment for a burn is determined by what caused the burn, the rule of nines, and the location of the burns in the body. In general, immediate treatment typically includes preventing further burning, like flushing the burn with cool but not ice cold running water. After that, it's important to manage pain with medication. Minor burns, like first and second degree superficial thickness burns, can heal on their own over a few days or weeks by keeping them bandaged and clean with soap and water. Sometimes lotions to prevent drying or topical antibiotics can be used. If blisters form, it's best to leave them alone because the intact skin helps to prevent infections. For more serious burns like electrical and chemical burns, or second or third degree burns in sensitive areas like the face, hands, and genitalia, hospitalization in specialized burn centers is often needed. In those situations, it's important to replenish lost fluids and electrolytes, and to prevent infections with antibiotics. Surgical procedures like skin grafting, excision of dead skin, or amputation, especially in third or fourth degree burns, may also be needed. So, to recap, a burn is injury, protein denaturation, and cellular damage that occurs in the skin caused by extreme heat or cold, electricity, some chemicals, or radiation. The degree of burn is determined by whether the epidermis, dermis, or hypodermis are affected, and each degree has specific symptoms. The rule of nines, the cause of the burn, and location of the burn can help determine treatments. In general, treatments include minimizing the initial burn and pain management. Minor burns don't typically require treatment beyond keeping the area clean, moist, and bandaged. But severe burns may require more extensive medical intervention, particularly hospitalization at specialized burn centers, to prevent infections and dehydration. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in a deeper dive on this topic, take a look at osmosis.org where we have flashcards, questions, and other awesome tools to help you learn medicine.
Okay, so just a little bit of review and, and to take a look at some other things. When we look at the rule of nines, keep in mind that this changes when we have children and it's a little bit different and it's worth noting. When we do the patient assessment of burns, we want to classify the victim's burn and it's classified as it mentioned, the source of the burn, the depth of the burn, and the severity of the burn. During scene size up, ensure that the factors that led to the patient's burn injury do not pose a hazard to you or your crew. Don't forget to look for the mechanism of the injury. Even though the patient may be burned, keep in mind we have to consider other injuries as well. Considering the mechanism of injury and nature of illness, well, the patient reports will often provide some important information about the extent of injury. Assess this, the scene for any environmental hazards. Determine the number of patients. Call for additional resources early if necessary, especially if there are hazards that you can't handle on your own. Consider the potential for spinal injuries, broken bones, inhalation injuries, and other injuries. Primary patient assessment begins with the rapid exam. Form a general impression. Look for clues to determine the severity of injuries and the need for rapid transport. Be suspicious of clues that may indicate abuse, either child abuse or elder abuse. Consider the need for manual spinal stabilization and check for responsiveness using the APPOOST scale. In all patients whose level of consciousness is less than alert and oriented, administer high flow oxygen by way of non rebreathing mask and provide immediate transport. When we assess the airway of, and breathing, be alert to signs that the patient has inhaled hot gases or vapor. Look for singed facial hair or soot in or around the airway. Heavy amounts of secretions and frequent coughing may indicate a respiratory burn. Assess the patient's talking. If they have any um, hoarseness in their speech, consider a possible airway burn. Airway burns are very serious and they can develop fairly quickly in a small amount of time. These are patients that need to be assessed by a paramedic or transported quickly to the emergency department. Airways can close up due to burns. And it's best to have the most qualified people able to make uh, respiratory and ventilatory uh, assistance with endotracheal intubation or even cricothyrotomy. You want to control significant bleeding control obvious life-threatening external hemorrhage before airway and breathing and assess for shock. Shock frequently develops in burn patients. Consider transport of the patient rapidly who has an airway or breathing problem. Any significant burn injuries, any significant external bleeding, signs and symptoms of internal bleeding, and consider consulting ALS providers early in the call progression. When taking a patient history, investigate the chief complaint. Be alert for signs or symptoms of other injuries due to the mechanism of injury. If the patient was burned in a confined space, always suspect an inhalation injury. When burns result from explosive forces, be alert to other internal injuries and fractures. Obtain a medical history and be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms and pertinent negatives. Keep in mind, patients who are elderly or anyone with underlying conditions can be especially susceptible to burn injury. Along with your sample history, ask about whether they have difficulty breathing, any difficulty swallowing, which would be an indication of upper airway burn, or if they're having any pain. Listen for hoarseness in the patient's voice. Also watch for 
carbaceous sputum, meaning any sputum that has any black or smoky stuff in it. Check whether the patient has an emergency medical identification device. In your secondary assessment, perform your physical examination of the entire body. Assess the patient head to toe looking for decap BTLS. Don't forget to roll the patient to the side and examine the back. Make a rough estimate using the rule of nines for the extent of the burned area. Determine which classification of burns the victim has sustained. Determine the severity of the burns. Package the patient for transport based on your findings. Make sure you get an accurate set of vital signs. Obtaining vital signs early will help you determine any changes in route. Monitoring oxygen saturation is very important on these patients, especially ones that you suspect may have airway injuries. And especially if the patient has been in a confined space, make sure that you watch, if you can, their carbon monoxide using a carbon monoxide monitor. A lot of the ALS monitoring devices, the LifePak 12, LifePak 15, and the Zoll monitors all have carbon monoxide monitoring on them. On the reassessment of your burn patient, reassess and evaluate interventions and treatment. Provide the hospital personnel with a description of how the burn occurred, Describe the extent of the burns, the amount of the surface area, again, using your rule of nines, the depth of burn, whether it's superficial or full thickness, the location of the burn, and if special areas are involved, they should be specially mentioned and documented. A steam burn can produce a topical scald burn. Minor steam burns are common when microwaving food covered with plastic wrap. A flash burn is produced by an explosion, which may briefly expose a person to very intense heat, such as lightning strikes uh, cause flash burns. In the management of thermal burns, it's important to stop the burning source and cool the burned area if appropriate and remove all jewelry. We've heard horror stories in the past of pa patients showing up in the ER by ambulance with you know, still smoldering clothes on. Remove all jewelry. In the areas where jewelry is worn, especially rings, those areas can swell and actually swell up over the jewelry. Always maintain a high index of suspicion for inhalation injuries. Increased exposure time to a burning source will increase damage to the patient. The larger the burn, the more likely the patient is to be susceptible to hypothermia and or hypovolemia. Keep in mind that these areas, they don't have the temperature control or the temperature control that is part of the skin's job is damaged and they can be susceptible to hypothermia. And these wounds, these burn wounds can weep tremendously and cause hypovolemia. All patients with large surface burns should have a dry, dry sterile dressing applied. Inhalation burns can occur uh, in enclosed spaces. We normally see these in house fires or in ships. Upper airway damage is often associated with the inhalation of superheated gases, and the lower airway damage is often associated with inhalation of chemicals and particulate matter. In both, keep in mind, alveoli are damaged. The exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is horribly decreased, and the patient's in danger of suffocating. When treating a patient for inhalation injuries, you may encounter severe upper airway swelling requiring immediate intervention. 
consider requesting ALS backup if the patient has signs and symptoms of edema, such as strider, hoarseness in the voice, singed nasal hair, burns of the face, or carbon particulates in the sputum. Apply cool mist, aerosol therapy, or humidified oxygen to help reduce minor edema. Apply an ice pack to the throat to reduce swelling, provided the tissue in that area does not have burns. The combustion process produces a variety of toxic gases. The less efficient the combustion process, the more toxic the gases that may be produced. Carbon monoxide intoxication should be considered whenever a group of people in the same place all report a headache or nausea. Cherry red skin, lips, and nail beds are commonly observed in patients who have died from CO poisoning. Again, the cherry red skin is normally a late sign. Hydrogen cyanide is generated by combustion. Signs and symptoms of hydrogen cyanide poisoning involve the central nervous, respiratory, and cardiovascular systems of the body. Faintness, anxiety, abnormal vital signs, headache, seizures, paralysis, and coma are all indications of hydrogen cyanide poisoning. And we see this in modern house fires where so many of the products are made of uh, artificial materials, you know. So that combustion of those produces these more toxic gases. In the management of inhalation burns, first ensure your own safety and the safety of your coworkers. Pre-hospital treatment of a patient with suspected hydrogen cyanide poisoning includes decontamination, making sure all possible soot is off the patient, and supportive care until an antidote can be administered by ALS providers. The antidote that's given is in what's referred to as a cyano kit. These are very expensive and they're not used very often. In some cases, only one rig in a district may have this. It's normally a command a response rig. Care for any toxic gas exposure first by recognition, considering that they're exposed, identification, finding out what they're exposed to, and then giving supportive treatment. Chemical burns can occur whenever a toxic substance contacts the body. Most chemical burns are caused by strong acids or strong alkalis. The eyes are particularly vulnerable. The severity of the burn is directly related to the type of chemical, the concentration of the chemical, and the duration of the exposure. Be careful about being exposed to hazardous materials. Determine if you can safely approach the patient. In some cases, it may be necessary to wait until a hazardous materials unit has decontaminated the patient. Wear appropriate chemical resistive gloves and eye protection whenever you're caring for a patient with chemical burns. Treatment for chemical burns can be specific to the chemical agent. The severity of the burn will depend on the type of chemical, its strength, the duration of exposure, in the area of the body exposed. To stop the burning process, remove any chemical from the patient. Always brush dry chemicals off the skin and clothing before flushing the patient with water. Remove the patient's clothing, including shoes, stockings, gloves, and any jewelry or eyeglasses. Take great care to ensure you do not come in contact with the chemical. The patient should be properly decontaminated by properly trained personnel. For liquid chemicals, immediately begin to flush the area with large amounts of water. Continue flushing the area with gallons of water for 15 to 20 minutes 
after the patient says the burning pain has stopped. If the patient's eyes have been burned, hold the eyelid open without applying pressure to the globe of the eye while flushing the eye with a gentle stream of water. As with any substance, once the fluid has been contaminated with the chemical, collect it and properly dispose of it. Conduct a proper, proper decontamination prior to loading the patient into your ambulance. Electrical burns may result from contact with high or low voltage electricity. High voltage burns may occur when utility workers make direct contact with power lines. Ordinary household current can cause severe burns and cardiac arrhythmias. For electricity to flow, there must be a complete circuit between the electrical source and the ground. An insulator is any substance that prevents the circuit from being completed. A conductor is any substance that allows a current to flow through it. The human body is a very good conductor. Electrical burns occur when the body or part of it completes a circuit connecting a power source to the ground. The type of current, magnitude of current, and voltage influence the serious, seriousness of electrical burns. Your safety is particularly important when you're called to the scene of an emergency involving electricity. An electrical burn injury appears when the electricity enters and exits the body. Two dangers specifically associated with electrical burns, the amount of deep tissue injury and cardiac or respiratory arrest from the electrical shock. Keep in mind that as the electricity enters the body, it flows along conduction and least path of resistance. So bones and vessels are where the electrical path would go through. Keep in mind, if the hand touches the electrical source, it goes off through the foot, you're gonna have all the damage between the hand and the foot, which can also involve core vital organs that could be damaged from the electrical shock and be burned on the inside. Electrical current can cross the chest and cause cardiac arrest or arrhythmias. If indicated, begin CPR on the patient, apply the AED. Be prepared to defibrillate if necessary. Give supplemental oxygen and monitor, monitor the patient closely for respiratory and cardiac arrest. Treat soft tissue injuries by applying dry, sterile dressing on all burn wounds and splint suspected fractures and provide rapid transport. Acute radiation exposure has become more than a theoretical issue because the use of radioactive materials has increased in industry and medicine. Potential threats include incidents related to the use and transportation of radioactive isotopes and intentionally released radioactivity and terrorist attacks. First determine if there has been any radiation exposure and then attempt to determine whether ongoing exposure exists. There are three types of ionizing radiation, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma particles. Alpha particles have little penetration energy and are easily stopped by the skin. Beta particles have greater penetrating power and can travel much further in air than alpha particles. Beta par particles can penetrate the skin, but can be blocked by simple protective clothing designed for this purpose. Bunker gear, firefighters bunker gear, is effective against beta particles. Gamma radiation is directly proportionate to wavelength and its threat. Gamma radiation tends to be very penetrating and easily 
passes through the body in solid materials. Most ionizing radiation accidents involve gamma radiation or x-rays. People who have sustained a radiation exposure generally do not pose a risk to others. However, particularly in accidents involving explosions, patients may be contaminated. When we manage these patients, make sure you stay a safe distance and wait for a hazmat team to decontaminate the patient before initiating care. Most con contaminants can be removed by simply removing the patient's clothes. Make sure you call for additional resources. Once there's no threat to you, you can treat the ABCs, treat the patient for any burns or trauma, irrigate wounds, and notify the emergency department. Identify the radioactive source and the length of the patient's exposure to it. Limit your duration of exposure, increase your distance from the source, and attempt to place shielding between yourself and any sources of gamma radiation. In recent years, law enforcement has increased the use of tasers. These weapons fire two small darts, they're electrodes, that puncture the patient's skin. They're barbed and generally treated as impaled objects and removed by a physician. In some jurisdictions, including Kitsap County, EMTs are permitted to remove these barbs from the patient. There are potential complications for patients when these devices have been used, particularly when the patient has experienced certain underlying disorders, such as excited delirium associated with illegal drug ingestion is considered a true emergency and warrants assist by ALS. Using a taser device in patients with true excited delirium has been associated with dysrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. Make sure that you have access to an AED when you respond to patients who have been exposed to taser shots. Keep in mind too, that in general, we can remove tasers unless the taser dart is in an eye, in genitalia, or in a mouth, or in the nose. Those have to be transported, and those tasers are normally removed by the physician. All wounds require some level of bandaging. There are many types of dressings and bandages. Dressings and bandages have three functions, to control bleeding, to protect the wound from further damage and prevent further contamination and infection. Most wounds will be covered by universal dressings, conventional 4x4s and 4x8s, and any assortment of small adhesive type dressing and soft self-adherent roller dressings. Universal dressings are ideal for covering large wounds. Gauze pads are appropriate for smaller wounds. Adhesive type dressings are useful for smaller wounds, band-aids or larger self-adhesive uh, dressings. Occlusive dressings prevent air and liquid from entering or exiting the wound. You see here a couple different dressings. This is the large trauma dressing. You see here it's 10 inch by 30 inches, and these would be very appropriate for large wounds. And of course you have the smaller gauze sponges they come in sizes two by two, four by four, that you can use for smaller wounds or to apply direct pressure to stop bleeding. This is the occlusive dressing. This is the Vaseline gauze or petroleum gauze that we talked about earlier. And this prevents air from going through. So keep in mind that any open wounds, especially in the chest or the abdomen, may require an occlusive dressing. Keep dressings in place during transport. You can use soft roller bandages, rolls of gauze, triangular bandages, or more, more commonly adhesive tape. Keep in mind that these are normally looked at as soon as you get in the ER. A self-adherent soft roller bandage uh, are easiest to, move, to use. Adhesive tape can hold the smaller dressings into place 
and don't use elastic bandages to secure dressings. Um, that's ace bandages in particular. If a wound continues to bleed despite the use of direct pressure, quickly proceed to use a tourniquet. Well, this concludes the lecture on soft tissue injuries, and I look forward to talking to you all in class.